going to be something you can establish. So that's what we want to talk about as a convergence. Now, to give you an idea of how conversions work, here is my favorite example. <laughs> okay, very first impression, you look at this, and what you really should see is just a bunch of dots, okay? First impression should be a bunch of dots. Now, after that, you should see something. What are you seeing? You're seeing a dog. I can actually see a few hands out here, so you know, how many people don't see a dog? Is anybody that doesn't see a dog? Okay, that happens every once in a while because you know, there's so many dots out there you don't see it. That's an important piece of information to remember because even though there's a whole bunch of us that see a dog there, it isn't as absolutely clear as it might be if it were cleanly defined lines. Nevertheless, the locations, the placements of the spots, all of that information, there's a dog standing over there. So for those of you who aren't seeing it, that's the head of the dog that's down. You're looking at a Dalmatian that's drinking something from the ground, foreleg, left hind leg, right hind leg, body. There's even a kind of a tail hooking around here. Okay? We, as human beings, have minds that are capable of creating cohesive patterns out of incoherent information. How many of you have stared at a tree, a cloud, a carpet, and seen a face in it? Okay? How, is the face there? Absolutely not. The, the reason that we see it is because we have a mind that creates things and it tends to create faces because we are so chemically wired to see the face. It's so important for us that we tend to create faces. The difference is if you blink two or three times, sometimes you look back and you can't find it. Once you've seen the dog, you cannot unsee the dog. It actually is there. May be difficult, we may not have all the data that we need to be able to clearly define it. But once you have seen the dog, that dog is there and you cannot unsee the dog. That's the kind of evidence that we're going to be talking about. We will not have a complete picture. We will not have a jigsaw puzzle where every single piece of the puzzle is there and there will not be any gaps. But what we will have is a sufficient picture that we can see the dog. And I will tell you that having been in, through the Book of Mormon in detail over the last several years, there is, it's now impossible for me to unsee the dog. This is a text that took place with real people in a real time, and there's no way I can see it in any other way. Because I've seen the dog, and I understand that it's there. Now, here's the next problem we have with seeing the dog. We'll start talking about the evidence for the dog, and someone will say, uh, you know, that spot, there, there's no reason why that spot's unique to this dog. You know, I've seen things that have had a spot like that that weren't a dog. Well, yes, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Which is why when you look at all this kind of evidence, you can't take one piece and say, well, you know, this one thing is going to prove it. It isn't a single thing. There, in any good historical document or in historical argument, you are not going to find the one single thing where you say, okay, here is the smoking gun. This is the one thing that does it. We only have one way of coming up with a single action that we could take that will prove the Book of Mormon, and that's prayer and revelation. You know, you pray, you get revelation. That's the only single thing that will demonstrate it. If you're looking at an historical argument, you need to have an argument that has a lot of pieces together, not worrying about the single thing. Now, we do have to make sure that that really is a dot and not something that we're not looking at. It really does have to be real information. So that's where we are, is trying to move on from that. So here's the kind of thing that we want to take a look at, and I'm going to run through uh, a lot of this stuff pretty quick. Some of the stuff I'm not even going to mention hardly at all. And then I'll try to end up with some of the things that I kind of find most fascinating about seeing the dog in the Book of Mormon. Different types of convergences of information. We're going to talk a little bit about geopolitical convergences. This is where we're talking about the fact that we have to have it on the map somewhere. And then even more complicated than putting it on the map is we need to know something about the peoples that were there. So converging that type of information. Chronological information. 
uh, you have to have a chronological convergence. One of the best arguments that I've heard for uh, understanding that the Book of Mormon could not have taken place uh, in the Great Lakes area is because people didn't live there at the right time. Anytime you see a theory that's positing people that don't live somewhere you know, that are supposed to be there and they're not there, it's not a real strong theory. Anytime uh, one of the theories of Book of Mormon geography posits that you must have an area of the world underwater at a time when people were living there, um, probably not a very good thing, even if they were underwater some other time in geological history. Chronology makes the difference. You have to match the right time periods. You can have absolutely the right thing happening, and if it's a thousand years too late, it doesn't count. It isn't a convergence. It isn't even close. Cultural convergences, once we get those first two done, then we need to look at the culture of the area and whether or not that converges and the descriptions match the kinds of things we find in the Book of Mormon. And the last is my favorite one, which is I call a productive convergence, which is where understanding the context of the Book of Mormon and the place where it would have taken place actually teaches us something about the Book of Mormon that we would not understand otherwise. In other words, it becomes a way to elucidate the text in particularly in places where the text might be a little bit confusing or a little strange. Okay, geopolitical stuff. Um, I'm gonna slide, slide over this one. Um, see if I can point out some of the things. You can you know, read this on your, uh, on your sheets. There's two of the correlations that I'd like to put up here. I am not a geographer for, I cannot tell you what reason, I simply, I just don't comprehend this stuff. I, I understand people and I understand uh, archaeology and ethnohistory, but you know, I just I don't seem to do geography very well. Uh, so I'm going to rely on other people on geography. But here is the problem that you have in geography. What you must do is you must create a convergence between the descriptions of the text and a place in the world. And there's two of them I'm going to show you. Both of these are converging in the same general area of the world. They simply interpret the data slightly differently. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know how to distinguish between the two as of yet. But for the purposes I have, they agree in the places where I need them to agree. And so I'm not too worried about it. Uh, the rest of it will work out. But here's the problem you have. You have to take the text and the descriptions of geography in the text, and you have to find a way to match it up in the real world. This is an incredibly difficult proposition. Uh, John Sorensen has discovered at least 400 different kinds of textual correlations in the Book of Mormon, which if you are going to have a convergence between the text of the Book of Mormon and a geography in the real world, you've got 400 things that have to match. This is not an easy process. If you're matching 400 locations in relative distance from each other, uh, in topography where you go up and down and it's consistent in the right way, you know, this is simply difficult to do. There's a recent article that uh, attempted to say that Book of Mormon geography is so vague that you could probably put it anywhere, including the Malaysian Peninsula. It was an interesting idea. Some of the things actually worked out. Uh, one of the problems, however, is that based on that particular geography, uh, all of the Lamanites had to be in the very, very bottom tip. And the problem is, you know, have all this area that's Nephite and based on the Nephite geography, but all of the Lamanites that the texts tell us are more numerous than the Nephites are in this little tiny area. And it just doesn't work. You just don't have that kind of population distribution. On top of that, the next thing I'll talk about is the other reason why the Malaysian thing won't work. But uh, to start off, we've got to get a geography. You're looking at the Yucatan Peninsula, Isthmus of Tehuantepec, and basically this is the correlation of how John Sorensen would lay out the Book of Mormon in this land. Larry Paulson, who's a member of FAIR, uh, has another idea of how to do it. Uh, slightly different, what he does is kind of fascinating because it, in one way we have to make sure that we understand it. What you'll see at the top is this north-south axis, and that really looks familiar to us because as modern Americans, we conceptualize directions and cardinal directions as a plus sign. 
what we miss is that Mesoamerica did not. Mesoamerica did not use the concept of a plus sign whenever they described the world and the four quarters of the world, they used an X. So for them, this is north, not that single line that we think of, but that pie, that whole piece of direction is north. It changes concepts dramatically when 